Welcome this morning to Church Online again. Good to see many of you out there and all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed on this bright, beautiful Sunday day. I trust you've all had a good weekend, and I know that some of you I trust were able to get outside and enjoy a bit of a January kind of weekend. It hasn't exactly warmed up, but for, for many, it doesn't stop us West Coasters from braving the elements that are out there, including those who do the market every Saturday. They never know what's going to come their way, but they are uh, vigilant in their, in their uh, service to, to the community that way. Um, this is a time that we normally gather, and uh, in, a, in, a, in a setting like this, it's, it's great to call us to worship, and to call us to worship is really just a, an opportunity for us to come and bring focus to our minds through prayer, through a meditation, through the reading of scripture. And I want to take us this morning to the, um, the book of Malachi. And it's the last of the prophets recorded in the Old Testament. Some would say Malachi if you're Italian, the Italian prophet, but actually it's Malachi. And uh, Malachi gives a call to worship. And it is the Lord who calls, of course, his people to worship. And that worship actually becomes an avenue for making the Lord's name renowned among all the nations. And so when we say a call to worship, it's an expression of, of a bringing us and our attention and our focus to the Lord. And that call then is to make his name known. And this is what it says in Malachi 1, chapter 1, verse 11. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And every place that incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. And so this morning I call us to that Lord. I call us to that place of, of recognition of, a, of an offering that is pure. And we take that into the New Testament context where Paul writes in Romans 12 that we are the living sacrifice. We are that presentation of ourselves and that's what we have to offer all because of jesus christ as we've learned so well in the book of colossians he takes preeminence over everything and so this morning would you join me in prayer as we call each other to worship to worship over this next hour that we have together and father god i give you thanks for a morning where we have time that's set aside to corporately gather and although it looks uh, different in each one of our living rooms, you are the same, the same God who is present from yesterday into today and will be into the future. And so we call upon the name of the Lord, that in this time that we have together, we will make your name great. And as we do so, Lord, we, it, it, we're reminded that if we lift Jesus high, he is the one who draws people into himself. And so, Father, may we find ourselves elevating the name of Jesus Christ this morning and bring worship to you, bring praise to you in our attitudes, not just lip service, Lord, not just nodding or giving a nod to you, but in, in all that we have and all that we can and all that we are able by the Spirit's prompting to bring worship to you in all that we do and all that we say. And we say together, Amen. Amen. Just want to share with you this morning as part of the call to worship, just a, a reflective song. We're not going to have a lot of songs this morning. Our service is going to look a little bit different, our gathering. And uh, we are going to be uh, interacting a little bit with, with uh, the tail end. As you know, we've finished Colossians, but it's not quite the exclamation point on that as of yet. And I'll share a little bit about that in just a bit. But let's Let's go to a place of, of worship. Spirit. The song reflects well the, the call of every believer to 
the spirit to come. Just looking at all the faces that are out there. I'm glad you guys are able to join us again. Good to see the smiles from Taya. Hi, Taya. <laughs> and many others that we call our church family. And uh, this, um, there's Raya too. Yes. And Kieran. and Kieran. Hey, you guys. Good to see the kids in there. Um, this morning, after a couple of weeks, of course, actually about the better part of two months since uh, just before Easter going online, it's been an opportunity for us to evaluate, uh, to look at uh, what's going on, not only in our, our world, let alone in our area here in Esquimalt and, and beyond in Greater Victoria. A um, lot of questions around what's, what's going to happen come the summer, the future of being able to get together physically. Uh, we haven't got all the answers yet. We know that some of the restrictions, of course, have been lifted and are slowly lifting and graduating into different levels. Um, we may see level three yet, and there's talk of the rec centers being open. Now, I've heard that actually from various sources. That is the case, but each rec center is going to be uh, obviously trying to get their own protocols in place. And uh, the reality right now for us to meet in that place is, is, is not near in the near future as in the next month or so, uh, but also as your leadership team and elder have, elders have met, um, we've been making some plans as far as what it would look like for us to get together a few times physically over the summer. And that is, of course, very welcome for, for many. Uh, some of you saw the email out yesterday about the... Uh, opportunity for us to get together as early as the end of June, and that is June 28th. And uh, we look forward to being able to get together in our backyard for, for that. Oops. I'm just going to share the slide with you here about that. My team of uh, kids that help me normally with morning Sunday morning are not here this morning. They've been away, but I wanted to bring that up. So this is the opportunity for us come June 28th at 11 a.m. Uh, as you are feeling comfortable around just the various uh, restrictions and concerns of COVID, but we want to have an opportunity for our first get-together, of course, since the, uh, the pandemic began, and that is in two weeks time, June 28th, at uh, the Bergman Backyard, uh, socially distancing, as we know, and uh, all the protocols in place for, for an opportunity to get together and have uh, a mini service together, some time to fellowship, and then enjoy some time together with a, with a meal. So praying that the weather will be, be great for that as well. We also have Zoom prayer meetings that are going on right now every Thursday evening at 7 o'clock. And uh, there's a login for that that is being sent out via email every week. You can share that with one another or email Bill Standeven. Uh, for more information on that, but seven o'clock on Thursday nights to pray for one another, to care to, for our community with compassion that marks us as a church. And we do that every, every Thursday evening as well. Um, also, coming next week, actually, for us, but into next Saturday, uh, Kim Noah, and of course, it's been interesting to try to navigate graduation for the high schools in our area, let alone for Esquimalt High School. But the class of 2020 is getting creative this, this year, and they've asked us to spread the word around that there will be a car parade for all those who are interested to cheer on the Esquimalt class of 2020. They're very, getting very creative with their commencement as well, that this parade will uh, end up going to the red carpet, if you will, for many to walk down to receive their diploma and, and then to be recognized and then get back into their cars and away they go. So it'll be a fun uh, day for, for or week for the graduates this year. And of course, we have two graduates, uh, both Nate Jackson and Nathaniel Laringeris. And those two boys are uh, going to be celebrated at our church service next week online, a service that I'm calling Grads and Dads for also is Father's Day next Sunday. And so we want to honor both the fathers, the dads, and the grads. And so we're putting together some creative ways of doing that. And of course, we invite you back to participate with that as well. 
Let's continue in, in worship as we uh, draw our hearts closer to God, the way, the truth, and the life. Great declaration, recognizing the preeminence of Christ. There are many who are looking for op opportunities, answers, answers to questions that, as we've read and studied through the book of Colossians, that is very clear, as Paul writes in the timeless words of Colossians 1, that he is preeminent over everything. That God was so pleased to dwell, and the word is fullness of God dwelt in the person of Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, as we recognize the firstborn over all creation. And then this is an incredible hope that we have, that uh, the mystery has been revealed, that is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That Christ resides in us, and the very fact that we have his presence with us is, is the promise of eternity with God. And there's such an assurance of salvation that comes with that that Christ would make himself 
and humble himself to such a point that as Paul records in further on in Colossians uh, 2, that taking all of our sins, all of our transgressions, all that was the accuser has, has wanted to throw at us, and he takes it and he puts it on the cross, and it stays there and it's crucified there so that we can be reconciled, which is a great word for simply being made right with God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And that's what you'll find every week as we gather at Harborview and uh, that we will be here to share the scriptures, share the truth of Christ, that Christ is our life, that Christ is all in all, around all, beneath all, sustains all, and cares for all. And uh, we want to make that promise, of course, to you that scripture is, uh, will, be, will be shared, expressed, and encouragement taken from there with uh, the gentle conviction and leading of God's spirit. Um, back to where we were uh, just earlier as I was sharing with, with you. We're entering into the summer months. In fact, next weekend is the official start of summer. One would wonder, it hasn't exactly warmed up yet, but there is promise that it will come. But next week, as we launch into, uh, into summer, we want to have opportunities beginning the following week with, with some physical gathering opportunities, and then going into July and August with some other opportunities as well. Um, in between those times, we still will be having an online presence and an opportunity gathering here, but it may look a little bit different. Um, sometimes we try to get a lot in or done on a Sunday morning, and, it, and I think I get a sense that many people are getting screened out in these days. Uh, de depending on how your life goes, maybe you're at work or you're at home working, a lot of time is spent on the screen, and, and uh, although it's a great medium, uh, we can get screened out for sure from uh, inundated from week to week and day to day with that stuff. So we want to make sure that this time that we have together on Sunday morning is not just filling time, but it's, it's, it's time that is well, well spent. Um, but it doesn't need to be full on hour and a half service, but we like to streamline that time that we have together so that we can do something within an hour, preferably maybe 40 minutes. And instead of having a full on a sermon or message that we would have meditations and opportunity to interact with each other. And that leads me into what this morning is going to look like as well. Yes, we finished our teaching through the book of Colossians, uh, but what I'd like to do is, is have a bit of a question and answer time this morning. And how we're going to do that is uh, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions and then you can answer. No, not necessarily. What I'd like to have is, is if during the last couple of months of uh, interacting with the book of Colossians, there may have been a particular passage that grabbed you. Uh, there may be a question that comes up and goes, hmm, not so sure about, about that, Paul. Can you give me a greater context of that? We've covered some, some important theological statements of who Christ is, as well as what it looks like out at, to, to live that out in our daily lives with one another, husbands and wives, team members at a work in a workforce, or uh, the ongoing day-to-day -day relationship with our children. And so there's lots that can be unpacked in some of those verses if you so have some questions or inclined. So we want to respect the opportunity to, to have that. Now, if there isn't any questions, then, hey, we, will, uh, we, can, we can shorten this time and then we're, <laughs> we're out of here. But we don't necessarily want to do that. I have a few primer questions that uh, made available that I think would be really important. But I found um, a particular group of uh, individuals that are out of the state of Oregon, I believe, and they put together what's called the Bible Project. Now, some of you may have heard this. This is a fantastic resource for, for the church, you and I. And the Bible Project, you can find it at bibleproject.org, and they go through the variety of different scriptures and put, it, put the themes of books, etc., into a very concise form that is very palatable for people to to understand the, the scriptures. And so I thought it would be appropriate this morning for us to view a, in less than 10 minutes, an overview of the book of Colossians. And in the book of Colossians, of course, in these four chapters, it covers quite a few themes, but uh, the Bible Project folks do a great job of capturing those themes in a concise and uh, measurable uh, expression 
that you can follow along. And so I want you to see and view this. If you've got some notes or a pad of paper or something you want to say, hey, that kind of grabbed my attention, maybe that can springboard into, into a question for us to, to entertain this morning. But I find this very uh, informative, and I'd love to, to share this with you. So would you join me as we watch from the Bible Project an overview of the book of Colossians? Paul's letter to the Colossians. It was written during one of Paul the Apostle's many imprisonments for announcing Jesus as the risen Lord. And the letter is addressed to a group of people that Paul had never met who made up a church community that he didn't start. This church in Colossae was started by a co-worker of Paul's named Epaphras, who was actually from that city. And Epaphras had recently visited Paul in prison, and he updated him on how well the Colossians were doing overall, but he also mentioned some of the cultural pressures tempting them to turn away from Jesus. And so Paul wrote this letter to encourage the Colossians to address the issues that Epaphras had raised, and then to challenge them to a greater devotion to Jesus. The letter's design and flow of thought are pretty easy to follow. The opening movement focuses on Jesus as the exalted Messiah. Paul then goes on to show how his suffering in prison is for the exalted Jesus. And then he addresses the pressures tempting the Colossians to turn away from Jesus. After this, he explores the new way of life that Jesus' resurrection opened up for them. So the letter opens with two prayers. Paul first thanks God that he learned from Epaphras that the Colossians have been totally faithful to Jesus, showing love for God and their neighbors, all because of the hope they have in the new creation that Jesus has in store. And so he moves on to pray that they would grow in their wisdom and understanding about Jesus. And then Paul has placed a poem here to help the Colossians and us do exactly that. It's the centerpiece of chapter one, a poem all about the crucified and exalted Messiah. It has two parallel stanzas, and it's crammed with language and imagery from the books of Genesis and Exodus, from the Psalms and the Proverbs. The first stanza explores how Jesus is the true image of God. In him, the full character and purpose of God is embodied in a human. He's the firstborn, an Old Testament phrase about Jesus' royal status over all creation. He shares in the very identity of the one true creator God. And by him, all reality, all powers and authorities, spiritual and human, have been created. It's in Jesus the Messiah that we discover the very author and king of creation. And so in the second stanza, we discover he's also the one bringing about a new creation. He's the head of a new body, which refers to Jesus' people, who are the new humanity, of which his own resurrection existence is a prototype. In him, God's glorious temple presence dwells, and so it's through Jesus' death and resurrection that God has reconciled himself to humanity, to all spiritual powers, to all of creation. It's a remarkable poem, and Paul will keep referring back to it as he goes on in the letter. So he first shows how the truth of this poem transforms his own experience of suffering in prison. He's being punished for announcing to the Greek and the Roman world that Jesus is the resurrected Lord and King of all. And so his suffering, he thinks, is not a sign of defeat. It's actually his way of participating in Jesus' own suffering done as an act of love. And so his hardships are actually a cause for joy. He's imprisoned for the surprising news that Israel's resurrected Messiah is creating a new multi-ethnic family. And more, just as the divine glory dwelt in Jesus, so Jesus dwells in and among his international family. Or as Paul says, the Messiah is in you all, the hope of glory. Paul then addresses the cultural pressures that are tempting the Colossians to turn away from Jesus. They were confronted by a combination of mystical polytheism along with a pressure to observe the laws of the Torah. So all these new Christians, they had grown up worshiping the various Greek and Roman gods who governed different arenas of human life. And many simply included Jesus as one more deity that they could worship. There was also great pressure from the Jewish Christian community for these non-Jews to complete their commitment to the Messiah by following all of the laws found in the Torah. Specifically, he mentions eating a kosher diet, observing sacred days, and circumcision. It's very similar to the problem he addressed in the letter to the Galatians. 
For Paul, to give in to either of these temptations is compromise. It's a failure to grasp who Jesus really is and what he did on their behalf. The Colossians used to live in fear of spiritual powers and elemental spirits, as Paul calls them. But Jesus triumphed over these. Through his death and resurrection, he freed the Colossians from any obligation to them. In the same way, Jesus fulfilled on our behalf all of the laws of the Torah, which never had the power to transform the selfish human heart anyway. And so what Jesus did in his life and death and resurrection, it lacks nothing. It doesn't need to be supplemented by following the laws. He is the reality to which all of the laws of the Torah were pointing anyway. Instead of the laws, followers of Jesus have the power of his resurrection to change them, which is what he goes on to explore. Following Jesus means joining his new humanity because their lives have now been joined to the risen Jesus' life. And this is why Paul challenges the Colossians to set their minds on things above, where the Messiah is seated or rules at God's right hand. Now, Paul doesn't mean here, think about how you'll one day leave earth and go to heaven. Rather, the heavens are the transcendent place from which Jesus rules now over all of creation. And from there, he will one day return here to transform all things. Or, as Paul says, when the Messiah who is your life is revealed, you too will be revealed with him in glory. So Paul challenges them to live in the present as the kinds of new humans they will one day become. He uses the image of their old humanity, characterized by distorted sexuality and destructive speech. For Christians, that humanity died with Jesus and has been replaced by his own new humanity, which is characterized by mercy and generosity, by forgiveness and love. And this humanity, it transcends the ethnic and social boundary lines of our world to create create, in Paul's words, a people where there is no one Greek or Jewish, circumcised or uncircumcised, slave or free, but the Messiah is all and is in all people. Paul then gets really practical and he shows the Colossians what this new humanity might look like in a first century Roman household, which was a highly authoritarian institution where the male patriarch held the power of life and death over his wife and children and slaves. Not so in a Christian household. Here, the risen Jesus is the true Lord. And so, in the Lord, the wife allows her husband to become responsible for her. And the husband is subject to Jesus by loving his wife and placing her well-being above his own. In a home where Jesus is Lord, children are not objects, but are called to maturity and to respect. And parents are to raise their children with patience and understanding. Christians who are slaves are to honor their human masters precisely because they're not the real master. Jesus is. And Christians who have slaves are to understand that this slave is not their property, but rather a fellow member of Jesus' body to be honored and embraced in love. And Paul's walking a very fine line here. He is reshaping the most basic Roman institution around Jesus who rules by his self-giving love. And so while he doesn't abolish the household structure out outright, the exalted Messiah demands that it be transformed almost beyond the point of recognition for any Roman living in Colossae. You can see this most clearly in the letter's conclusion. After a request for prayer, Paul applies these instructions about Christian slaves and masters. And we discover that Tychicus is the one carrying and reading this letter to the Colossians. And he's accompanied by a certain Onesimus, who was a former slave to a Colossian Christian named Philemon. And we discover from another letter addressed to Philemon that Onesimus had escaped from his master. It was a crime worthy of imprisonment. But Paul asks the whole church to greet Onesimus as a faithful and beloved brother in the Lord. And then in the letter to Philemon, Paul says that he should receive Onesimus no longer as a slave, but as a brother. Talk about ending the letter with a punch. So in the letter to the Colossians, Paul is inviting us to see that no part of human existence remains untouched by the loving and liberating rule of the risen Jesus. Our suffering, our temptation to compromise, our moral character, the power dynamics in our homes, all of it must be re-examined and transformed. We are invited to live in the present as if the new creation really arrived when Jesus rose from the dead. And that's what the letter to the Colossians is all about.
So there you have the hose turned on full as far as capturing the whole book in essence of, of Colossians in less than 10 minutes. Um, it's a great Bible class, actually. And uh, even in my all my studies in this, uh, when I reviewed that, I'm like, man, this is fantastic. It's something that could be looked at a few times as uh, as you review and understand a little bit more of the book of book of uh, Colossians. And because in it, it was actually, as we know, the cultural context of of it was uh, uh, when Paul was doing this teaching, he was rocking the the Roman world. In fact, he came under incredible scrutiny, as did the early believers and Christians. Because of their um, because of their way of life, meaning that they were thinking it was somehow undermining the the Roman government. In essence, it was, but in a in a great way because it wasn't about Rome being the the, the savior of the world, as it is Jesus Christ being the preeminent one to save save the world. So <clears throat> the hour is already forty minutes into our time, and I wanted to respect our time. And I thought, hey, what about uh, if anyone has some questions? There's ways that you can do that by using the, uh, the, the screen chat that we have. You can introduce a question or two or a statement about, uh, about the book of Colossians or something that you found quite profound. Um, you can do that, or you can unmute yourself and just say, hey, I'm right here. I'd like to ask a question uh, audibly if there's something that's, uh, that's on your mind. So by all means, would you, uh, would you do that? Seeing no hands and seeing no questions as of yet, but you can fire that fire that in. Is there Hello. anything else out there? Okay. Go ahead, Niels. You can hear me. So cool. I don't know if it's so much of a question as a statement, but I, I love the uh, um, the declaration in Colossians about there being no distinction, and I mm -hmm. think that's very timely in light of what's occurring in recent weeks. That. Uh, um, Jesus's community transcends ethnicity and transcends the the many differences that we um, place in our own communities and societies globally. And if, once we grasp that that Jesus transcends all of that, and that there's no distinction uh, between Jew and Greek, or slave and free man, barbarian, Scythian or as it states in some of his other letters, male and female. Um, yeah, it's very freeing. Yeah, actually, that's uh, one of the main statements that's so strong, Neil. Thanks for bringing that up. Because Colossians 3.11, which you read, um, talks about the different racial background, um, that there's no, there's no qualification uh, of coming into the kingdom of Christ that uh, Christ is all that matters. And uh, when he, in essence, as you saw in that, in that video, that he creates a whole new humanity. And that whole new humanity that was being upheld and established in the first century has not changed. It actually con continues unto this day. And as you mentioned, it's very appropriate given the incredible racial um, discrimination that we are seeing in our world today and the heightened aspect of that in the last two weeks for sure. I mean, it's inundating our, our culture. And as Christians, we can speak into that now. And that's what, what Paul is talking about here. It doesn't matter if you're a slave. It doesn't matter what level of what work you have or who you, who you are in a culture that tends to want to put uh, greater ownership upon, hey, oh, you're in that position or you're in that kind of work. So you're worth not at all. And that is what uh, the, the Christian church actually transcends that because we recognize the foot of the cross has always been level. The foot of the cross has always been level. You do, you can, we all approach it with the same humility and understanding who Christ is. And so that's what is so important that there's no background that disqualifies you from coming into the kingdom. And the, that's the beauty of the Christian message as opposed to any other, other of the world religions that you can come just as you are. Thanks, Niels, for that. Anyone else have a question? <laughs> Thanks, Anders. <laughs> I 
from Bill who brought up a question here. He says, uh, we are to live in the present as the kind of human we will become. But I find myself, especially at my age, struggling with things from my past. That means is to spend more time living in the past. And how do I stay present centered? Great question. Thanks, Bill, for that. If there's this, if there's this new humanity, um, and Paul writes that I forget, I neglect or I forget what is behind me, and I pursue that which is before me. Does that negate the negate my past? Or how do I live right now? And that is an ongoing struggle for lots of believers who feel like they're still having to, this residual of their past and the experience that they've had in life that the enemy would like to come and just say, hey, you are worthless because of this, or you can't come to the throne room of grace because of what you've done over here. And the reminder that we have through the New Testament and in Paul that in Christ, we are all now new, we are a new creation. The old is gone, behold, the new has come. And again, the gospel message, which means the good news, is that my past is forgiven, that I'm present with Christ and accepted and renewed with him. And then as the book of Colossians talks about that, I have the hope of glory. And we, we recognize every day that, that as we wake up, it seems like um, we understand the scriptures that his mercies are new every morning. And to come back to the, the power and the statements of what God has said in his word, that we are continually encouraged by the fact that that the accuser may come, but we continue to respond to the, to, to the accuser saying that, no, I'm a new creation. I cannot be, I'm no longer touched by what has taken place in the past because it has been forgiven. Does that mean that we don't process through that? Absolutely, we need to do that. And if things come up under the gentle conviction of the spirit to be able to say, hey, I just want you to process through this. Maybe there's someone in your past that you haven't um, reconciled with to the best of your ability or you haven't expressed forgiveness, those are the opportunities of which in that light be able to take that past and bring it to the present with Christ and say, I present this to you in the best of my ability by the power of the Spirit. I express forgiveness. I express, express grace to that person. And you make, a, you make a stand at that place and you, you come back to that place and say, you know what? That's where I forgave that person. I don't have to go back to that again. I have released that in the name of Jesus. And so that's a great, great point of, of uh, the beauty of, of living, in the Christian, the, living the Christian life. We don't have to have the baggage, folks. We can let go of that baggage and we can press on. Thanks, Bill, for that. I don't know if there's any other questions, but I've got, uh, I've got one um, that kind of ties into what the last question was, and that is by whose power, whose power are we as believers strengthened by? And it's important to come back to that. As Paul talks about in Colossians 1, verse 11, he says this, we also pray that you will be strengthened with all glorious power so you will have all the endurance and the patience that you need and may you be filled with joy by whose power is the believer strengthened by whose power are you to to take up every day of course it's through the power of the resurrected christ and because of that divine power of christ it is what enables us as christians to then respond to any of the testing and the the trials or the tribulations that we face on a regular basis what happens as a natural default in our thinking is when trials or tribulations or concerns or anxieties or stresses of the day tend to hit us, we default back to this is the way I've done it before. And because of the fear or the anxiousness I have, I'm going to try it this way. But we know that it continuously leads on a path that goes, oh, I'm so frustrated by this process. But in the same power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that enables us to take a step into that fear, into that anxiety, into that tribulation and say, no, because of Christ's strength, I can endure this. And the character that comes from 
responding to that rather than reacting to that is the key because Christ becomes more and more in you and greater the hope of glory. And so the believer is strengthened by Christ. And as a result of that, we can respond to our testing and tribulations in that same power. And that's just in the first 11 verses of Colossians. We, of course, we know that this book is packed with other great stuff. And if anyone else has any other questions that are out there, it's good to bookend this, this, uh, this study in Colossians. Here's one. It came up. Why do we have to make our peace with God? That might seem, seem obvious, but Paul talks about in Colossians 1.20, saying that, and through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made, and here's the word, peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. I have a guy that I'm working with right now. I'm, I'm uh, doing a, a basement suite. The fellow is 83 years old, and he is moving in with his daughter, and I'm doing a little bit of a, a tenant improvement to his place and in increasing the footprint, et cetera. Anyway, he's an 83-year-old gentleman, grew up with a knowledge of the Bible and an Anglican background from England. And um, we were talking about his timeline left on earth. He says, Paul, I'm 83 years old. I don't know how much time I have left here. And uh, the, the question arises, have you made your peace with God. And when we hear a statement like that, sometimes it's like, I have to do something to, to, to make my peace. Yes, in essence, we have to receive that. But the importance of making our peace with God is to actually recognize already what Christ has done for us. That we are only to respond to it, as Paul talks about, and respond how? By faith. It is through faith. To simply believe, as Paul states here, to continue to believe the truth and to stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. And it's the idea of constantly coming back to the understanding of the reconciliation of God through the person of Jesus Christ who brings that assurance of salvation and to stay put in that place. Don't drift away, as Paul talks about, encouraging us from empty philosophies, ideas, keeping religious holidays, doing certain uh, uh, aspects of, if I only do this, then God will appreciate me more, etc. Paul says those are all empty. It comes back again and again to the person and work of Jesus Christ. And then that... God made you alive in Christ, for he forgave all our sins, canceled the record of the charges against us, took it away by nailing it to the cross. Amen. Amen. And that's where we stand, set right. I had the privilege of being out for dinner last night with some great friends who were with us this morning and uh, got talking about just behavior and how life um, you know, we have difficulties in life and, and we capture catch ourselves saying things or believing things or having an attitude that goes, oh, I fall short time and time again. It doesn't matter if you get it right 99% of the time. That 1% that we don't get it right is exactly what still separates us from God. But thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ that he makes up, doesn't matter if it's 1% or 99%, he does it all. He does it all. It's a level playing field. So don't let anyone condemn you, let alone yourself. Christ has set us free. Praise be to God. Hey, Paul, I have a question for you. <laughs> um, I've always wondered, if this is in uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 24. Paul says that I'm glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I'm completing what remains of Christ's suffering for his body, the church. 
I've always wondered why Paul feels that he has to complete Christ's suffering um, when, I, I guess I'm not fully understanding, I thought that Christ's suffering was completed like on the cross. So how does that, I don't know, I guess what I'm asking is what, what is Paul exactly meaning and saying there? Yeah, the, uh, you would think that, that uh, in the initial reading of a passage of scripture like that, that somehow Christ's sacrifice wasn't enough. That would be the automatic default. You think that, that somehow Paul, through his sufferings, is completing the work of Christ. And uh, I remember when I studied that back a couple of months ago, it was, it was curious. And I don't know if I can do it quite the justice here because you raise a very difficult question. So uh, whatever I fall short with right now, you may want to do your own research on this as well. Paul is not saying here, folks, that, that in any way that he is making up the difference of what Christ had to go through in his suffering through the cross. No, it was full and complete. Paul is rather here recognizing that in his sufferings, in participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, he's been given the responsibility. And with that responsibility comes a heavy weight, if you will, of carrying on the gospel message, recognizing that he will have to suffer for this as well. But he frames it in such a way that, that it's not necessarily something that he goes, oh, this is way too much. No, he frames it in such a way, he says, I participate now in the sufferings of Christ. That what he had to endure, I now can endure because of what he suffered. In fact, anything that I have to suffer will pale in comparison, but I get a small taste of what that is for the hope and the glory that is ours in Christ Jesus. And so he proclaims this uh, entire message. He says, I, God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message. That's not to say that the message of Christ is, is, is a, a walk in the garden. By no means is that the, the case of, of trying to live that out. We know that in this world we will have trouble. But Jesus gives the, the promise, but be of good cheer or be of great hope for I have overcome the world. It is through Christ's suffering that, uh, that, we over, that we have overcome and we participate openly with joy if we get to suffer with him as well. Thanks, Candace. Jerry has his hand up. Jerry, would you uh, unmute yourself there or Cam, if you could unmute Jerry and then we can hear his question. I don't see Jerry. There he is. Hi, Jerry. Hi, Paul. How do we share the gospel with unbelievers in our family? Thanks for question. The last part of chapter three and into chapter four deals with instructions for Christian households. And here's my first part to that answer, Jerry. Um, first and foremost, Paul says that um, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Be an Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. And I think it begins there in, uh, to begin with is that your actions – your behavior and your attitude is, uh, is what is first caught by those who are unbelievers. And so that the world is always watching. As I learn with my children, more is caught than that which is taught. And so as we pre present ourselves in how we behave and how we receive people, because we all put off a certain persona when we meet somebody, and if we've got a judgmental attitude or a particular look, that will maybe turn somebody away from, from actually the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we are the living personification of Jesus Christ. So first answer to that is live your life in such a way so that when people see it, they'll give glory to God. Secondly, 
as Paul mentions here, let your speech be seasoned with salt. He actually uses that word salt in the, in the original language. And of course, as we looked at that just a couple of short weeks ago, that the salt adds flavor. And when we, when we say something that is in response with, our, with a speech that is seasoned with grace, that is gentle, that is kind, it actually says in scriptures that it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. It's not the wrath of God, as some things might say. It's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. And so as we live our life in our behavior and attitude, and as we speak out in life with how we say certain things and what we, how we say that, that will become attractive to Christ. And obviously, how will people know unless they hear? We need to speak that about Jesus. Say, this is my testimony. This is what Christ means to me. And then we leave the work of the spirit to convince them and to convict them and to draw them unto himself. Thanks, Jerry, for that question. Anybody else out there? Hi, can you guys hear me? Hi, Rebecca, you betcha. Okay. Good to see you. Welcome, my uh, Ontario friend. Okay, so I have a question from your last response. Uh oh. So you said, uh, in part B of your answer, you know, to leave the conviction and for the Holy Spirit to work within within the other individual. Yes. So my question is: Is the Holy Spirit in the other individual if they're a non-believer? And where's that Holy Spirit? And so, is it where's the Holy Spirit? Yeah, they're, great they're question. Not, yeah. Okay. The the simple answer is the Spirit is everywhere, as we know. Uh, but for those who have received by faith the the person of Jesus Christ, who brings peace between God and man, we receive the package, if you will, of salvation, which includes the Holy Spirit. And so, the Spirit resides within us. And so wherever, we're, wherever we go, of course, we take the Spirit with us. But Paul also talks about the importance of praying for those who are unbelievers. And then he says this about how we are to pray for them. Pray that the, the scales will fall from their eyes. And so there's this work of God through the believer to say, in essence, Lord, I pray for so-and-so who I love. Would you please bring and, and, and bring understanding, in essence, to remove the scales from their eyes so they may see the, the, the work of God in their life. So God is always working. We recognize, as it says in Romans uh, 3 through to chapter 3 to chapter 5, that there is nothing that, that we can do to try to cause a regeneration. We are completely dead in our sins and our trespasses. That's why the Spirit can't reside until we actually respond. And so the God is the one who raised Christ from the dead. He can raise those who are dead in their sins to new life. And so he can actually cause that person to be able to see the gospel. But of course, it's their choice to respond. So the spirit is at work all around them and through us. And as soon as they make the response, then bam, they get, this, they get the gift of the spirit. So that's an aspect. Thanks for going on that. Anything okay. else, Rebecca? No, very good. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. That's awesome. Yeah. Some good lively chats uh, uh, around this, as I can, as you can imagine, um, it's been good already and rich. I trust that you guys have had some time here. Just another question I have that I'd like to bring to your attention as we, uh, there, the last part of chapters three and four talk about living, living out this life in in uh, in a daily in our daily encounters with one another. One of the things that is, I think is so important that we should leave, well, maybe we'll leave on this note, and that is when we do any kind of work and we wanna do work for the kingdom of God, and we wanna do it in such a way that, that uh, it, it's, it's reflective of, of Christ in us who is the hope of glory. And Paul says in Colossians 3, verse 24, 
He says, but if you do what is wrong, oh, sorry, no, remember that the Lord will give you inheritance as your reward and that the master that you are serving is Jesus Christ. And he's talking about the relationship between husband, wife, children, and employer, employee, slaves, free, all that kind of stuff. And I think it's really important as to recognize that anything that we find that we do, the encouragement is that we do it as unto the Lord. And that, uh, that synopsis we just looked at, that, that we do everything for Christ, who is the head of the church. And so we don't do it to try to get any kind of appeasement or to appease God. We can't do that. Uh, God did all the work anyway. So anything that we do is in a response to Jesus. It's a response and an actual offering to, to God. And so folks, many of you will be going out this afternoon and let alone tomorrow morning going back to work. And may I encourage you that everything that you do, do it as unto the Lord. As the old King James Version, whatever your hands find to do, meaning representing the physical aspect of our bodies, whether it's raising your kids from bed tomorrow morning and getting them fed, to going to work to the office and interacting with people, let your speech be seasoned with grace, and that whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. And when you have that kind of attitude, you'll watch and begin to see the spirit work in and around your areas of influence. My friends, this has been Rich. And I look forward to getting together again next week as we, uh, as we congregate to talk and celebrate grads and dads. And uh, I know that we've got a couple of special things that you won't want to miss next week. It'll be a fun, interactive and uh, may I say, exciting church service. So I, I invite you to that. Um, we always have an opportunity after our time together to uh, have a chat room, uh, time to have uh, opportunity to pray together. If you, if you want prayer or just to catch up with other people, there'll be an opportunity to join a chat room. You can click on that and enter into it. Uh, if not, uh, I bless you and um, ask that you will continue in this same vein in the spirit of Christ to be the salt and light to our world. Just uh, again to mention the parade uh, next week, that we have uh, a parade route through Esquimalt. We'll get that, that um, poster put up to our Facebook page so you can see the route and uh, get out there and cheer on, cheer on the grads. Right now, receive the benediction as we listen to uh, a great song.
Lord, be gracious to you. Be gracious to you. We take from Philippians 4, where Paul says, I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ, who gives me strength. Lord, bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you all that you need today. Have a great week, my friends.